Hello again, ladies. Uh, patience is a virtue, and we certainly had it tested this afternoon. We had a computer glitch uh, at the 1.30 program time, and our gracious speaker, Jessica, and the guru and saint in my book, Derek, <laughs> raced down from Stanford to get us set up. Um, he's letting, lending us his computer, so I hope you enjoy the program. Monica is uh, an author. She's entertaining just on a social level, and I think you'll enjoy all of her slides. She did give a lovely presentation before, but she wants to get going. So thank you all for tuning in again. Bless you for your patience. And if I drank, I would have a bottle of wine in my hand. Thank you. God bless you, ladies. Here, I introduce you to Monica Randall. Um, I guess we'll just start at the beginning. Okay, so we're going to be doing a program on a Louis C. Tiffany and uh, not so much about his work, the glass work, so a little bit, but things that you wouldn't hear or read about anywhere else, and I'll get into why that is. So here he is as a young man, approximately around the age of 35, I'm not 100% sure, but he looks quite young and dapper here. And um, he came from a very, very prominent family from Massachusetts, going back to the 17th century, where uh, his families were, you know, they did uh, a silver. They were silversmiths. And then, of course, Tiffany's father, Charles, who was born around 1902 or 1912, he founded the famous Tiffany uh, jewelry store on Fifth Avenue, which was made famous by the uh, Truman and Poe movie that starred Audrey Hepburn sometime in the 60s, thereabouts. But it's always been a very, very a popular store. People come from all over the world to look at what is available there. So young Louis, as a young boy, growing up right here, very short distance away in Irvington, along the Hudson, he was not like his sisters and brothers. He was not an average tomboy Know, boy, boy, he tended to be, um, how can I put it, a delicate, uh, very, very sensitive. He would stare at flowers for hours. He was fascinated by clouds and birds. And he would go around along the shore, along the Hudson, and look for little bits of glass, broken bits of glass, which he would stare at for hours on end. So at some point, as he was moving into his teens, he made the announcement to his dad that he didn't want to have anything to do with the, um, the silver, silver business or the great store on Fifth Avenue, that he wanted to be an artist. At which point, his parents decided to do, which was a very common thing back then, they sent him to military school over in New Jersey to shape up and fly right and become more of a, a he-man, you know, play with guns and, and that sort of thing. And um, because of that, he became very, very ill. It was not his nature. It was not something he could ever, you know, take to. And um, <laughs> when he was on the verge of dying, his parents were notified and they decided to indulge his true passion, which was to paint and be an artist and so they, they spared no expense. They sent him on all kinds of ocean liners all over the world to any and as many exotic places as he cared to visit. So he spent a lot of time in Tangiers and in Morocco and in Persia, North Africa, Cairo, Tibet. And he noticed that the light in these countries it was very, very intense. It had a strong effect on him. He was also taken by uh, French impression, impressionist Claude Monet's paintings. He liked them very, very much. And he started painting when he came back to this country after traveling for a couple of years. So this is one of his first paintings. Uh, this was actually painted in Irving Cliff where they live, oh, okay. I thought I could enlarge it, but I guess not. All right, so uh, this is a cow 
on their, their farm. They had quite a good property. And other sisters, aunts, and siblings, and cousins. has this very lovely painting, influenced, of course, by uh, Claude Monet. And then he started to paint the, um, the exotic places that he, he saw. We seem to be missing a slide. I have a feeling that the, the museum vaporized the slide of Cairo. Uh, so shortly after that, he started to, um, he realized he could not support himself. He got married, uh, I think the 1870s, he got married, he started having children, and then he realized that his paintings, which were criticized as being mediocre, he decided to turn all of his energies to um, working with the special class. And he had an extraordinarily brilliant mind. And he was the only person to come up with some kind of a, a formula where he mixed metals, a kind of alchemy, really, as I call it, where he would mix metals under a lot of pressure and mix it in with the, the molten glass. And it caused the little bits of glass to form uh, veins and more naturalistic types of, um, you know, petals and leaves that you would find in nature. So that separated him from all the other people who were doing, you know, stained glass windows. Then in uh, 1902, his father, uh, Charles, who owned the Tiffany store, uh, passed away and uh, Tiffany inherited $3 million, which was an enormous amount of money back then. And so he came to Long Island and he, Oyster Bay as a matter of fact, and he bought 600 acres of property that was right next door to uh, Teddy Roosevelt's home, the San Francisco. Roosevelt, who was president at the time, became his immediate next door neighbor. And they, for some reason, hated each other. <laughs> I'm not sure why, all kinds of crazy rumors, but they did not get along. Some think it was because of the wild parties that Tiffany was throwing at the house, all the lights of the Phantasmagoria, and it, it would cause a brownout in the whole town of um, Oyster Bay. But this rendering here, if you can see it, uh, was done by Tiffany. This is the early design for his house, which was completely different than anything that had ever been uh, built on the Gold Coast. Usually you have very conservative architecture, uh, Georgian colonial, um, antebellum style houses, you know, a marble palace or two, but this was more mission, Moorish, exotic, they, they couldn't quite put a label on it. It was a bit of a hodgepodge of the things that he had seen. And uh, with no help from an architect, he spent about two, three years constructing this. And he started, of course, hosting parties, unlike anything that had ever been done before. So from the, the clock tower, this would be looking to the west towards New York. He had a, a series of aqueducts or water, waterworks that began right in his living room and the water trickled down through all these little fountains and aqueducts and they led down to this enormous reflecting pool where he had acquired one of the largest of the quartz crystals ever, ever formed anywhere and they put it right in the middle of the reflecting pool. And then he designed a 30-foot copper dragon, which you see here, if you can see it, a dragon, right at the edge of the, the reflecting pool. And instead of shooting flames out of its mouth, it, it spewed forth water. And this is the front of the house, which is a common photograph that you'll see. Um, he shocked the locals in Oyster Bay. He, uh, he liked to shock people. That, that was one of his favorite things. He, um, he made a painting of all the local society ladies in the area, and he portrayed them as 
swimming nude in the local uh, pond. It's called She Swamp Pond. It's, it's, uh, it's a nature preserve, very charming. There's lots of little um, brooks and streams and waterfalls. Now, he installed this 12 foot glass, stained glass painting in his living room. And of course, photographs were made and people started to recognize themselves. And, you know, around this time, ladies were very conservative. They were still wearing corsets. They all went to church. They were very proper. They wore gloves. They wore hats. And then suddenly they're being portrayed in the nude for all to see. And he just thought that was hysterical. Um, before the days, I guess you could sue people for such things. Um, the entrance to his estate, which was called Laurelton Hall, uh, the driveway alone was a mile long, and you had to go under a kind of a, an arch, uh, a terraced arch, with one of the largest uh, palm conservatories in the country. Now, his living room, very interesting living room, it actually rose up 40, 40 feet, and it was based on uh, the designs and architecture of the Turkish baths, which, of course, he had seen and was very impressed with while he was in a Turkey. And the, the focal point of the room, of course, there's a, a reflecting pool right in the middle of the living room, but then you have this pear-shaped, opalescent crystal vase, which took six months for the glassworks people to make. So it's almost impossible to hand blow a, you know, a, a glass vase without it breaking, holding the weight of five feet, but he insisted it had to be five feet. And once that was completed, he would stare at it. Here's another shot of it. He would stare at it for hours and hours and hours, and he absolutely believed, and I agree with him, that uh, quartz crystals, which we're now starting to learn a great deal about it, uh, even from a, a scientific standpoint, but quartz crystals have a kind of living, vibrating energy. You can actually program them. In fact, a lot of these computers use crystal technology to get them to work. But he also believed that they were magical. He would stare at them, and he felt that he would pick up spirit energies that would inspire him. Um, it would transport him into some other realm, and he would create these, you know, fantastic ideas from uh, staring into them. And he also played, and he had a, a built-in pipe organ in the house. He had a full-time resident organist playing music whenever he was in the room uh, for, you know, for inspiration for his ideas. Now, his, his stained glass windows were, uh, I mean, they were the peak of popularity at this point. This, is, this would be right before the First World War. Uh, he was designing stained glass windows for uh, churches, the Lyceum Theater in New York, um, up and down the, uh, the Hudson River, the uh, Wilderstein, uh, the, the Roosevelt Compound, uh, Ogden Mills, Beechwood, all, all the famous estates, most, along the Hudson River had uh, pieces of artwork designed, all one of a kind, by uh, Louis Tiffany. He could not keep up with the demand for his artworks. And so in uh, Corona, Queens, he built a enormous factory. He had as many as 200 workers. He had one group uh, that was made up of about 50 women because only women could work with the tiny, tiny little pieces of um, little, little itsy bitsy bits of glass that had to be soldered. And, and only women had the dexterity in their fingers to, to create some of these, these artworks. He was a very, very busy man and very methodical and very obsessed. Everything had to be perfect. Um, this is looking to the north on his estate. This is about the only thing that survived. It's, it's called a minaret um, overlooking Oyster Bay Harbor, and it was studded with all kinds of ceramic 
a fix of glass. It's, it's still there. Something of a miracle. And this, of course, again is the front of the house. This, this is now at the Metropolitan Museum. You can go see it. It's in the American wing. And this is just an example of what shocked most of the people on the Gold Coast. You know, this very astounding group, a group of people who uh, it's very important to them to be listed in the social register. You, you had to be seen in all the right places, and you had to ride horses, and you had to own polo ponies, and all sorts of things that made up the Gold Coast. It, 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 extraordinary time in our history. That was founded on, of course, enormous fountains. So they were very conservative, as I mentioned. And when they came to his house for the first time, they were agog to see these eccentric little touches that you wouldn't see anywhere else. These are, this is one of the capitals at the entrance as you walk in the front door to his house. And it took a long time to make these uh, ceramic copies. The stems were very difficult. The stems were made of a single strip of glass, a uh, kind of celadon green. It was translucent. Uh, it had to be placed or so into the, the wet, the wet cement. Very, very difficult to do this. Um, and so there were four. Each one, each capital was a different color. This one is fuchsia. One was magenta. One was orange. And I, I'm not sure the other one was more of a golden, golden color, but they were, they were preserved at, at the back. And inside the house, instead of walls in the main room, you know, cement, I mean, there were stucco walls, the walls were about two feet thick, but in the living room, it was, it was like being outside while you were inside. Everything was glowing and reflecting all these extraordinary Colors. This is called a woman feeding her pet flamingos. And he did allow his pet, he did have pet flamingos and he had peacocks running around in the house, which people thought was odd. Uh, he loved peacocks. He was obsessed with peacocks. And it, that was a very common thing. I know years ago, even we had peacocks running around. Yard. It was just everybody. And he loved them so much that he built a building, which of course he designed in his backyard or his 600 acre property. And this was called the Peacock House. This is where the food and this is where they slept at night. Of course, it was heated in the winter time. And um, this is a more recent photo. So the, um, the weather vane on top of this uh, hexagonal shaped stucco, a little structure, it was painted bright colors. It's, it's copper and hard wood, so it's all faded, but at one time it was uh, quite amazing. I never got to see it when it was first you know, created. And here again, we have another shot of the dragon that is um, kind of encrusted or you know, perched on top of all these um, pale pink quartz crystals and an enormous quartz crystal right in the center. But in this shot, water is spewing out of the mouth of the dragon instead of flames. And everyone who went here got a big kick out of, out of this. Um, uh, this is Tiffany's private room where he created, or where he wrote down his ideas once he got these ideas. Well, staring at the pear-shaped crystal vase or listening to music, he would quickly come into this private study and he would hand uh, sketch his ideas and assign them to his workers at the, at the factory. Now, even the maid, the housemaids were never allowed in this room. And of course, from the living room, there was the, the reflecting pool, water would funnel out right through the living room into this enormous shell, marble shell, Venus rising out of a half shell. This is huge, absolutely huge. This is about, well, the shell was 12 feet wide and the statue was 
at least, at least 12 feet. And then water would trickle down out of the shell and it would flow down into these various lagoons where he kept water lilies. And of course, this was inspired by his passion for Claude Monet. Um, he just loved Claude Monet and his dedication to the water lilies. This is a lot of work maintaining these gardens, trying to make them look natural, the colors that to be harmonious. Everything was done deliberately. There were carp swimming. He had 70, 72 gardeners working on everything around the clock, except in the summer. In the summer, uh, it, it was a very, very lively place. So this is a, a photograph that was in one of his scrapbooks. And I probably forgot to mention that back in the 80s, um, I was in Oyster Bay having some uh, film, you know, the old fashioned film uh, process. And there was this lady standing next to me. She was very, very tiny. And I noticed she had a photograph of um, Tiffany. And I commented, I said, that looks like Louis Tiffany. And she mentioned that that was her grandfather. She was now living, you know, on the next estate to where World Hall was. Well, I just was beside myself and uh, followed her <laughs> to her car. And I told her I had to talk to her. I, mean, this, I felt this was fate. It was meant to be. She was very lovely, and she eventually allowed me to go to her house and make copies of things from their private scrapbooks. Uh, so this was in there. I assume these were all family members playing, I mean, it's not croquet, tennis, I gather. Um, now, Tiffany is, was known in the area for his amazing um, Arabian nights, uh, very, very exotic parties where he would invite as many as 800 people uh, some of the guests, I mean, these were the most prominent people, can actually see all the guests, but he would invite uh, John D. Rockefeller, John J. Pastor, Mark Twain, uh, Sarah Bernhardt, the actress, Isidore Duncan, um, Oscar Wilde, uh, Sarah Bernhardt, the actress, I mean, all of these people would come out to Long Island. He had a private train, it was a spur special spur at the Oyster Bay train station that went right up to his estate. His estate was built quite high, you know, on the hill. And if you were lucky enough to receive an invitation, which was delivered by the chauffeur, and he received this invitation, a very large one, and it was on a little wooden spool. It was done on parchment paper. And there were two little red tassels on each side. You had to pull it down. But the invitation was written in um, hieroglyphics, which of course is Egyptian, but the parties were Arabian in theme. A little weird. Um, but it came with an interpretation. Oh, what was the word on uh, interpretation? It came with the trans translation in English. And you had to RSVP. And it specifically said that you had to come in a costume. You would not be allowed in if you did not have a costume. He was very strict about that. But he had a, it was covered because that would take away from the ambiance. Oh, look at this song. Oh my gosh. It would take away from the mood. So if you dared to show up without a costume, because he ran around the world collecting them. And now I have a lot of them in my collection that the granddaughter gave me. If I put on exhibit right now at the Glen Cove Museum, if you're interested, you can see them in some of them. 14 carat gold, all kinds of jewels. Um, so you showed up, even in a tuxedo, which normally would be acceptable, you were ushered into this Arabian tent. And he had wardrobe mistresses, and he had racks and racks and racks of costumes, uh, and you were disrobed and dressed. And um, now this did not turn out, th this was a faded shot that um, was in the scrapbook. It has so severely 
oxidized. That gives it a certain drama. I don't know, maybe on a computer they could punch it up or something. Um, but these are some of the, the, the folks that came to his party. Now, his favorite people were not the wealthy. In fact, he had a dislike of wealthy people. He preferred the Bohemians. He preferred the people out in the Hamptons, uh, Manhattan. Uh, he would always invite psychics and fortune tellers and snake charmers. I mean, he loved eccentric things. Um, and you have quite a mix here. You can see some of the psychics, but he's also got a Viking, he's got Nero, he's got a Roman characters, and of course, gypsies, and the snake charmer, uh, one of the stories that the grandmother told me was that one of the, the cobras escaped out of the basket. It's brought by train. She actually brought three of them. And one of the cobras escaped and ran out of the house and attacked and tried to eat one of his peacocks. And they heard, you know, the gardeners, they heard the peacocks screaming, and I'm assuming that the poor little peacock survived. But this was typical weirdness. And these are just some of the, uh, the people that were recorded in, in the scrapbooks. This is, um, I don't know what is her name, Gertrude, Gertrude Vanderbilt Whitney. Uh, who spent $10,000 having his costume, costume made for her just for that one, one party. Uh, this is someone else, another one of his guests. I'm assuming that's a real, a trained peacock sitting on a, um, a silver platter, kind of an Egyptian feeling. Oh, no, is that a ghost? I hear banging coming from down the stage. Um, I'll, I'll assume it's a live peacock. Uh -oh. All right. And this really is was not um, taken at one of his parties. I just happened to find this. It's a painting, um, obviously taken in France, judging by the costume it was more in 1700. But it captures the feeling, the mode, the tone of his uh, extravagant parties where he would have thousands and thousands of colored Japanese paper lanterns and around midnight there would be a huge barge would float into Oyster Bay Harbor and there would be a 45 minute fireworks display. Uh, this is one of the things that annoyed Teddy Roosevelt um, next door. I actually heard one, so I was told that they were rolling around exchanging blows. I don't know if that's true, but whatever. Uh, now, this is kind of an interesting thing, and you probably won't believe me, but a book did come out to back me up. As it turns out, he may have been a little bit of a chauvinist, maybe, I mean, no question, Tiffany was an absolute genius, but most folks associate uh, Tiffany's works with um, his famous um, you know, lamps, the, the chimney lamps, which are now worth, I mean, the chimney lamp, the, the, the cereal lamp, I, I was told, sold recently at auction for about a half a million dollars. Originally, when they were first made for the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, they sold for a $575. That was a fortune. You could probably buy a mansion for that, or a very large house. That's a lot of money in 1893 for a lamp, but they were extraordinary. And during that uh, exhibition, which only lasted for six months, Tiffany was granted oh, dozens and dozens of medals from all different countries. That, that's a ghost. I think it's a ghost. We hear banging on the wall. Um, yeah, he received dozens and dozens of medals the originality of these lamps. You had the dragonfly lamp, you had the peony lamp, you had the water lilies, and the wisteria is probably the most famous. Well, guess what? He never designed a single lamp. They were all designed by this very petite little woman, here she is. Uh, her name is Clara Driscoll. 
and she worked in the, uh, the ladies' department of his factory. And she was paid $16 a week to work 16 hours a day. She lived in a boarding home. She was not allowed. W women who worked within this factory, they were never allowed to go on dates. They were not allowed to get married. Their whole life had to be spent you know, soldering little teeny little bits of glass, you know, for these women. But all the, the entire idea, the conception, the beginning to end, was the creation of Clara Driscoll. And Tiffany never let the world know that. It only came out recently. And if you don't believe me, uh, there's a book called uh, Clara. Is it Clara? Tiff Tiffany, Clara, and, um, and Tiffany, something like that. Greenland. Um, Susan, Susan Breland is the author. It got quite a bit of attention. It was written up in the New York Times about three years ago. And it'll give you an idea what it's like. She worked for Tiffany, who was very, very tough on his workers. Uh, finally, when she was 55 years old, she said she had it and she wanted to marry a woman that she knew many years in this, this boarding house. It's very dreary life. And he immediately fired her. <laughs> 55 years old. She's a one to have a life. Uh, now this is an interesting photo that was in a scrapbook uh, that the granddaughter had. Now here you see Tiffany. He's now getting on in years. He did live to a ripe old age. He lived to be 80, 84 years old. But he endowed the estate so that artists left billions and millions of dollars that artists could come only during the summer and just draw inspiration from his beautiful gardens, which were maintained by a staff at that point of about 40, 40 gardeners. Now, the woman that I met at the Royce to Bay camera store, uh, her name is Louisa. I knew her as Mrs. I had to call her Mrs. Colonel Platt out of respect for her name is Louisa, and she is on the left. The lady on the right, uh, Sarah Hanley, was actually Tiffany's nurse. Uh, she's from Ireland, and she uh, took care of him because he was now walking you know, with a cane, but he, he still created and worked every day. And he openly had an affair with her, which everybody knew, and he did something that folks just didn't do back then. This is now like the early 30s, so prohibition is probably still going on. He built her a little mini estate, a little mini mansion, right on the property, right down by the entrance for all the world to see. It was very, very bad form. I mean, you can do things like that. They were a little bit more subtle at that time, because like I said, people were very conservative. Now, this uh, is a photograph that I got out of uh, a, a book in the library. The book is called Rebel of Glass. This is the very last photograph that was taken in 19, um, the summer of 1955 or 56. And the next thing you know, three, three kids from the local uh, Oyster Bay High School one morning on March, uh, March 7th, 1957, three kids, local kids, were seen running from the mansion early, early in the morning. One of the neighbors was walking his dog and he noticed that the house was in flames. This is the Tiffany mansion in flames. Uh, this is from one of the local newspapers. Now the problem with putting the fire out was there were no fire hydrants. So they had to, they drained all the local pools, the swimming pools from the estates, and then they ran hoses down to the Long Island Sound, and they got it under control as long as it was high tide. As soon as it was low tide, the water was shut off, and it flew up again. Even though it was made of stucco, but the foundation, the structure was actually uh, wood, and the building burned to the ground. It actually burned for five days. Now, I remember the sky. I, mean, I hadn't actually seen the house 
before the fire. This is from the New York Times, an aerial shot showing how um, what, what, what a catastrophe this was. It's all stained glass windows, and probably billions of dollars worth of this artwork, which is now a museum, were destroyed. But some of it was saved um, and is now um, in a museum down in uh, the Morris Museum, you know, down in, um, in Florida, uh, where you can see some of it. And of course, as I mentioned, you can. Um, See the entrance to the house to the American Way at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And this is just a stained glass window, a skylight that I shot over at the Beechwood Estate, uh, which is now, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's going to hold there, it's not in its original form. These were, uh, you, you found uh, pieces of his work everywhere on Long Island in Glen Cove. This is an enormous, an absolutely enormous palm conservatory that was built by Captain Delamar, and you can't see it very well, but at each end of the palm conservatory, there's a three foot wide round sphere of globe with a tiny little bit of celadon green glass and a lavender butterfly, and they bulldozed this estate in 1968. With everything in it. Oh. Uh, these now the rest of the shots, just to finish up the program, these are just shots that I took from how it looks now. I mean, the house is gone. These were the cow, the dairy barns. He had a, a working farm. Uh, this I thought is quite beautiful. This survived. This is the wisteria garden with the uh, teakwood um, loggia. Maybe this is it. Summer. Uh, this was. I don't know if this is still there, but it was 20 years ago. The little pavilion to the tennis court, the outdoor tennis court. This was this greenhouse with, again, the Mission Moorish little um, temple or garden folly. And I suspect the swans in the foreground, they look fake to me. I think they might be wooden swans. And um, some of the gowns that we used to rescue wanted to bring them back to life. So I went over there a number of years ago and there was this beautiful marble statue, quite heavy, which is why nobody had stolen it. And I just took some pictures of a dress in the twenties. And this is of course my sister. Now this is still there. This is a tree house made of twig art and we had to walk a mile with the table, the flowers, the costumes, the china sterling silver to create this shot, which is uh, inspired by one of the paintings uh, by Renoir, uh, uh, by a, a water, a kind of a cafe. Uh, it's not exactly like it, but that was, that was the inspiration. And this is all that's left of the Palm Conservatory at Laurelton Hall. Very interesting as a ruin. This is what you'd see if you go to the Metropolitan Museum. The bronze statue of the little boy is not part of this collection. It's just sitting there. And this, of course, you can purchase replicas of this. This is our last shot. Um, I actually bought one. It's hanging in the back room, you know, covering the window. They're very reasonably priced. And so that is our program. Um, Louis Tiffany and his fabulous estate in Oyster Bay. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, it was certainly well worth waiting for, and we did wait. <laughs> so I apologize to the membership for the glitch today, and um, I am privileged to have sat here and watched it. And I hope that you get good reception at home, and when you're watching this, you appreciate all the lovely things. Uh, Monica is an absolute joy. She's a wealth of knowledge, not only about this, but about so many other things in this world. And uh, I'm sorry you will not have an opportunity to have a question and answer period. If anybody has any questions, you can email them to the office and I can call Monica and uh, she maybe could give you some answers. She doesn't do computers and things, so um, it would have to be done that way. But in any way, uh, I hope you enjoyed the program. 
And uh, again, I thank Monica for taking her time and bearing with us today. Thanks, ladies. Enjoy. Have a good evening. So weird. Isn't it so weird that you don't get to see? Oh, it is. It's very much a little It's very peculiar. Now I'm going to see if Marco's still around to help you get everything uh, out. Okay. Let me find him now. Oh, he can take that tomorrow. Which direction? Let me see. I don't even know if that's going to be here, but I'll go up and find out. I'll be right back, Monica. Oh. I am missing a bag, a leather, a, a tan alligator bag. Oh, my God. Oh, where's the bag? Did you bring it in? It's right here. It's a, a tan I remember it. I remember no, no, it. Was, it was right here. It's gone. Oh, it's right. Is it underneath you? Um, I, it was so recent for me to move it because everything else was pretty much, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. But nobody came in here, so it's got to be um, somewhere. No, I, I, no, no one was here. All right, you need to take it. Just take it. Take it. I don't need that. I had put the chip. Oh, you know what? It's probably under the trunk. Maybe. I shifted. I shifted. Maybe. Maybe. It's the only one I'll be no. No, period. Okay, good. It got squashed by my hand. 